special way today. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds. Silence other voices except yours, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Moses, which 
which the Lord had given to Israel. And Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden pulpit, which he had made just for this purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hophiah, and Messiah. On his right, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkiha, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam, Meshulam, on his left. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maseah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Kaliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, while the people remained in their places. And they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the peoples wept when they heard the word of the Lord. And then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to the ones who don't have anything prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. We believe this to be the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. So the psalmist starts, right, by saying that the heavens tell of the glory of God. The heavens are telling. There's no speech, of course, it says. There's no words, no voice. But the message of the heavens still gets out to us throughout all of the earth. All around us in the natural world, we see beauty and majesty. And as people of faith, we experience it often as the presence and the power of God. The earth, if you think about it, our home here is captivating and it's beautiful. And if we're paying attention, if we're paying attention, the natural world can speak to us and tell us who God is. Now there are several places in the natural world for me where I seem to experience something of God. It's not that I think God is those things in the natural world, but somehow God uses the natural world, creation, to remind me that God is with me. One of those places is when I'm driving down Middle Bush Road, which is my major commute, right? There are several farms, both on the right and the left, on Middle Bush Road. And on Sunday mornings, Pete and I just even noticed it this morning too, The sun it's, it's after the sunrise, but the sun is still waking up, right? And so it's gathering its strength, and it's sprouting these orange glowy things across the meadows. That's how we saw it coming from our left this morning. And another time when I, the heavens seem to tell me of God is in the evenings when I'm leaving <coughs> church from like a night meeting, right? It's surprising how little light pollution is in Kendall Park. I don't know if you've noticed, but our parking lot is actually kind of a clearing. And so there's this canvas of the sky that I walk out into. So right now, Orion is like right over there, right? And about 10 or 12 days ago, the thinnest lightest sliver of a moon I've ever seen was right there. And then of course, right this past weekend, the natural world dumped almost two feet of snowflakes on us, right? Each snowflake unique unto itself. The heavens tell of the glory of God. And here's what I think happens when we sense what the psalmist is calling the glory of God. I think the psalmist is talking about those moments in time when we're reminded about something beyond ourselves. 
I think the psalmist is talking about when we realize something is beyond us, we somehow find ourselves deep inside. We realize who we are and who we belong to. And in those moments, we are somehow filled and fueled and strengthened in our inner body. I experience that often in the natural world. I'm sure you do too. But the psalmist doesn't stop there, right? The words that we read together, the psalmist says that in the reading and hearing of the scripture is another way that we experience the glory of God. The psalmist says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The decrees make us wise. The precepts rejoice our heart. The commandments enlighten our eyes. And so we have this Nehemiah text to kind of give us an example of that. The people have come home from exile, and this is their first gathering in worship, if you can imagine, right? We haven't been together for two weeks in worship. These people had a generation gone since they had worshiped together. And this is their first worship experience. It says that Ezra stood on a stool, actually, that they made for this purpose, right? So here he is, standing a little bit taller than everybody else, and he reads, right? And it says that the people begin to weep, right? And he says, no, don't weep, rejoice, right? The joy of the Lord is your strength is how Nehemiah ends the text, right? There's another telling of this same story in the book of Ezra, which is one book earlier than Nehemiah. In Ezra's version, some people are weeping. And they're weeping because their they remember the stories that their ancestors told them of how great Jerusalem was. But then other people are rejoicing because they're being, they have been reunited in worship. And in Ezra's story, it says that the weeping and the shouts of joy mingled together so loudly that one could not be distinguished from the other. There was emotion, there was a visceral response to gathering together around reading the scripture. And it seems that worship then, kind of like the natural world speaks to us of God, has the power to remind us who we are deep inside and tell us who we belong to. And so I, think, I just think we take it for granted that week after week we gather safely Right? with tremendous freedoms, and we read the scripture. This act of worship together is powerful. It's beautiful, and it's an important part of our lives together. It's in worship where we experience the joys and the sorrows of life together, right? And we do it around the reading of scripture. Worship is a relational activity, right? It's not about me and God. Worship is about us and God. There are moments in our worship service that are particularly meaningful for me, and I love that the kids are learning about all the different areas so that they can maybe decide which parts are most meaningful for them, too. One of them is that I come into worship, and I do, I don't know if you heard them because they were, when they were walking in, they gave you my first two lines. Take a deep breath and settle into your seats. <laughs> right? Right? That's how we learn, right? We, we, we learn how to behave by mimicking behavior. And so, um, my moment is I sit in the pew, and I take a deep breath, and I find myself, and I connect, and then, uh, and then I open my ears to listen, and I hear the music, and then I hear all the chatter, right? And sometimes I'm like, oh, I just want a moment of silence, right? And some of you I know have shared the same thing. But then I remember that worship is not about me and God, that worship is about us and God. And the chatter before worship is absolutely about people reconnecting to one another, because they haven't seen each other for a week, or two weeks, or a generation. There's a rhythm in our lives that worship provides, right? Whether it's the chatter we hear each Sunday, or the prayers that we get to share with one another, or the way we affirm our faith after the sermon, right? Not all churches do an affirmation of faith. I'm kind of sold out to it, right? I'm because I didn't have it growing up. Maybe that's why I love it so much. But it's mostly because I'm banking on us holding faith together. I'm banking on it. And I know that you're banking on it for me. That some days you walk in and you know I need someone else to hold up this faith because I don't got it today. Right? <clears throat> that we, we trust 
and need one another to actually hold up, to affirm our faith together. It makes sense that the psalmist would couple these two images together, right? The heavens telling of the glory of God and the joy that we find when we gather around Scripture. Because in both places, we're reminded of something beyond ourselves. In both places, we're reminded of something that's true deep within us and who we belong to. And I think that in those moments, we are somehow filled and fueled and strengthened. But how often, I can't be the only one who just lets those moments pass by. I'm just, I'm distracted by my thoughts and my life and my plans and my needs and I just am not paying attention. And so things call out to me, right? The sun rises and I just <coughs> drive by it. The moon's there and I get in my car and I go home. I miss, I miss out. I show up in worship and I don't really look anyone in the eye and say, peace be with you. Right? I don't linger over a cup of coffee because I have things to do. How many times do I let, do we let these moments pass us by? And so my call to us is that we pay attention. That we be people who when we're driving or waking or sitting together in worship, that we would look for and listen for and feel for and wonder for the presence and the power and the majesty and the glory of God in our world and in our lives. Let's be people who drink deeply of who we are and who God is. And might that drink fill us and fuel us and strengthen us.